My name is uh, Dale Bracewell. I'm just here to give an introductory uh, welcome. Um, so I work at the City of Vancouver as the manager of uh, transportation uh, planning. I do want to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of uh, the Coast uh, Salish people. I also want to thank SFU, City Program and Urban Studies, for hosting this uh, great uh, dialogue tonight. And your uh, great uh, Andy Yan is going to give us some concluding words of wisdom after we hear from our, our presenters and some good uh, panel uh, and uh, discussion. I also want to thank uh, TransLink, uh, along with the City of Vancouver, another one of the, the local uh, sponsors and, of course, been uh, busy with uh, us and other cities in terms of the, the regional conversation uh, that uh, we're going to learn lots more in, in basically uh, the week to come. Uh, but I also kind of want to say, like, why are we here? And so one of the things um, that we've had the privilege of at the City of Vancouver is being a, a NACTO city. NACTO is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And one of the things that NACTO does uh, really well is that it engages uh, cities in kind of conversation. So like, you know, over a decade ago, uh, the big conversation that the major urban cities wanted to have was like, how do you do biking in, in urban cities? And of course, uh, we in Vancouver and other cities have advanced. Um, we use, of course, all ages and ability, uh, you know, bike networks and many uh, U.S. cities and, and Canadian cities were sharing in that space. And so, so kind of the new frontier to talk about together and to learn at the same time that, uh, as, as part of the NACTO network is this whole idea of whether it's mobility pricing or decongestion charging, con congestion charging or uh, um, pricing convening is kind of like the name of our workshop. So we're doing this at the same time, this lecture, um, sharing in, in that conversation. And so, so thank uh, NACTO for that. And, uh, the city of Vancouver, I mean, it is actually part of our policy uh, somehow, some way to, to work towards um, looking at uh, pricing all the modes of transportation, and so that would include uh, road user charges. And so um, if you want to dream with us at the city of Vancouver and you have, you know, goals of like public space and, and more walking and cycling, um, this is the type of conversation that we need to have. But, but it is one that's going to take some time. Um, it's not all going to happen next week when, when we hear from the Independent Commission on Mobility Pricing. And it's important us, though, to think of whether it's thinking like, you know, high-speed rail to uh, up and down the Cascadia corridor. It's starting to, as we start to have those longer-term conversations, you know, how do we weave in the conversations uh, like tonight um, on that front? And I think if you're, uh, if you're business-minded, uh, I'm learning a lot of these U.S. cities are studying it, it as well. And, you know, you might come up with a really good idea on how to do a temporary pilot of mobility pricing. And then you could basically, I think, market yourself going around from Chicago to San Fran to L.A. Uh, to Vancouver. Just a hint. I'm not a business-minded person myself. I think I'm a bureaucrat at heart. So I just offer that up uh, for anybody. Um, but it's also like as, as the city of Vancouver, we're preparing for all sorts of things in the future mobility. And so when we presented out to city council in January about getting ready for electric and shared and connected, um, and then ultimately autonomous vehicles. I mean, this is again going to be an important part is how are we going to price all the modes of transportation and even these larger uh, mobility uh, trends. So now I'm going to also introduce uh, one more partner for the evening uh, and a partnership that NACTO has with the NRDC is Amanda Eakin. She's going to be your facilitator for tonight. And so um, I got to know Amanda just last year at the last uh, NACTO uh, conference in Chicago. She's the Director of Transportation and Climate Change for NRDC uh, Solutions uh, based in California and San Francisco. And so Amanda called me up. We were starting uh, this working group and said, hey, Dale, what about this idea of convening cities kind of like once in between the, the NACTO conferences and, I don't know, five minutes in the call, and I'm like, yes, let's do that. And, and I really think Amanda is a fantastic champion uh, working with NACTO and bringing us all together in this conversation, going to be a great facilitator. So a couple of things I've learned uh, about Amanda that I just wanted to share is as it relates to mobility pricing, if you're familiar with what LA has done, uh, she was a big part of their 100 um, hours uh, campaign. Uh, so kudos to her and her involvement with that. She's uh, leading and uh, a Carfee family um, uh, in, uh, back in her hometown of uh, San Francisco. And, you know, just shortly speaking, I, I could go on about Amanda, but I basically I, I'm declaring her as a possible new candidate as mayor of San Francisco. Uh, so with that, Amanda, I think if you could come on up and introduce our, our keynote speakers for tonight. Okay, I will take it. I love it. Um, it's great to be here with all of you in such a wonderful city. Uh, my um, colleague uh, Chris and I touched down here on Tuesday, and we got to spend um, Tuesday afternoon biking around the city. And um, <clears throat> she'd only ever ridden once before, really, in San Francisco, and she, she expressed a little sort of trepidation about how dangerous uh, it can feel to bike ride in a city. Um, and I said, 
do not worry. <laughs> I've been here before on a bike and we're gonna be fine. And then we proceeded to have the most idyllic bike ride around the seawall and ex experiencing all of your wonderful uh, protected bike lane infrastructure. So it really is a, a model city in that regard. Um, NRDC, my organization, the Natural Resources Defense Council, is an international uh, nonprofit organization. We have offices in uh, New York, DC, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Beijing, and we've got about 600 people. We're focused very much on addressing climate change, creating healthy people and thriving communities, uh, and natural resources, conservation, of course. So uh, mobility pricing is just um, a, a really perfect policy example that can both uh, deliver ambitious climate um, uh, action at the same time as making our, our communities healthier and safer. Um, and just on a personal note, um, uh, Dale mentioned <clears throat> I live in San Francisco. I have two daughters. One is 10, uh, one is 11. And, you know, there aren't that many places that I can really ride with the girls in San Francisco. We go into Golden Gate Park one, one day a week. We have Sunday streets in Golden Gate Park. And the feeling that I get from them, when they cross, there's, um, you kind of get to the park, and then there's this car-free barrier. And when they cross that barrier, they just... <sighs> sense of relaxation that I can feel on them. They can take over the whole street, they can ride around, they're no longer just kind of worried because they have to ride next to these cars. And they even just, you, know, you can see it in their body language. Uh, and so I'm just wanting more and more places like that and I think it's, it's best for our cities. Um, I think you have your all ages and abilities, triple A bicycle rating scheme here. And that's really what we're talking about with mobility pricing, is making cities um, that are really safe for everybody to get around in the way that is most uh, sustainable and least polluting. So, so we have been, as Dale mentioned, over the last few days here, convening eight North American cities, all of whom are coming to the realization that if everyone chooses to get in a car to get around for every trip in our city, then our system just fails. It doesn't work for our city and it doesn't make for these wonderful, livable places like you've so clearly established here in Vancouver with the seawall, which is just people being able to walk and cycle. Um, so we're very, very interested in how uh, North American cities can pursue these policies in a way that also makes cities more healthy um, and more livable. So what we thought we would do here is to start with um, a little bit of an exploration of two of the most successful mobility pricing schemes that have been implemented around the world. And we're so fortunate that we're able to have um, Ben Plowden and Matthias Lundberg. Ben Plowden joining us from Transport for London um, and Matthias uh, Lundberg joining us from the city of Stockholm. Uh, ben has been with the Transport for London since 2002. So he's been all on the entire ride of implementing congestion pricing in 2003 and watching how successful it's been and thinking about evolutions of the program. Prior to joining Transport for London, he worked with a uh, pedestrian advocacy organization in London for about 10 years. Um, and I run into Ben kind of all the time at different conferences <laughs> around the world and it is really quite clear that he wants to share the successful lessons of London's congestion pricing scheme and hope to um, give other cities the chance to replicate some of that success um, in other cities around the world. So we're very, very fortunate. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Ben Plowden to the stage. Amanda Dale, thank you very much indeed. It's a real pleasure to be here, both in Vancouver, which, as Amanda said, is a, an absolute uh, revelation to someone from, from Europe, if you haven't been here before, but also to be here with you tonight. Uh, and I'm impressed that you resisted the temptation to go to the beach or sit in a bar and uh, spend the evening watching this on a, on a podcast. So just a quick anecdote about myself, Amanda, talking about her children. I, I first started commuting by bike to work in London in 1981. So I'm actually 74 years old. Um, I look great, because, but, but in 1981, I can tell you, when I got my first job in the Selfridges department store in the West End, it was a pretty lonely experience riding a bike in London. Every three or four days, I'd see another cyclist, be like, hi, how are you, how's it going? Uh, London has been transformed in the last 10 years or so by the sorts of investment that Vancouver has made. Uh, and to Amanda's point, I think all the cities that we've been talking with around the world, in Asia, in Europe, in North America, are all wrestling with this dilemma, which is how do you accommodate 
economic growth, population growth, uh, construction, uh, and reconcile that with livable lifestyles, with livable spaces, uh, and manage rising demand on a transport system, when in the case of the road network in particular, in most cities, that, that network is constrained. So in London, there's no real appetite for major new highway construction. The last time that was tried in the 1980s, it was pretty roundly defeated by popular resistance. Uh, so the question really for cities like Vancouver, for Paris, for London, for Stockholm, even for Beijing, is how do you accommodate continued growth and success uh, in a way that's both equitable but also takes account of uh, the constraints on the system. So I'm going to talk about London's experience and a quick word about London. Uh, London has an elected mayor like many US cities, uh, but that institution has only been in place since the year 2000. Uh, and the first mayor was uh, somebody called Ken Livingston who introduced congestion charging. So London is quite new to the game of being run by an elected mayor. Um, and Transport for London, where I work and have been there since, almost since the beginning, uh, is the mayor's transportation authority. And to an extent, which isn't true in many other cities in the world, pretty much touches every facet of transport in the city. So we pretty much either run, contract, regulate or fund every aspect of transportation in the city, which allows us to plan and operate the network in a truly integrated way in terms of ticketing, customer information, integration between services, how you tie your infrastructure investment together. So we have a huge advantage uh, compared to many cities that we have that capacity to do things in a planned way. But I'm going to talk specifically tonight about the idea of mobility pricing or congestion charging or decongestion charging as one tool in a metaphorical toolbox that a city can use to think about managing and optimizing demand on a, on, a, on a fixed network, in the case of the road network, and what other cities can hopefully learn from London's experience, because we went early with congestion charging in 2003, uh, and I think we've learned quite a lot both from that experience, but also how the debates moved on in the intervening 15 years about why you want, might to think about evolving the pricing mechanisms for use of the road network. So first of all, let's talk a bit about what's been happening in London since the mayoralty was created back in 2000. So back in 2000, the population of London was about 7 million people, and about half of the trips, of the 23 million or so trips a day in the city, were made either by walk, cycle, or public transport. So by 2015, the population had grown to about 8.7, nearly 9 million people, and in that period, the proportion of trips made by walk cycle or, or transit public transport had gone up from about half to about two thirds. So we were able to enable and encourage people to move away from private car use at a time when the population and total travel volumes were growing in a growing city. So we've increased the proportion of trips made by those three modes uh, at a time when population and transport demand was growing. That's quite a significant achievement, uh, and it was brought about by a number of reasons, and congestion charging in the central area was an important part of that, but was only one tool in the toolbox that the mayors of London have managed to deploy to achieve that shift in, in travel choice. Like Vancouver, like Stockholm, like other successful cities dealing with it now in an international economic uh, environment, London's facing some very significant challenges. So the key statistic on that slide is in the top left-hand blue box, the population of London is forecast to rise again from about 8.6, 8.7 million up to about 10 million people in the next 15 or 20 years. So that's a very significant increase in population. It's the equivalent of two metro trains a week of new people coming to the city to, to raise families, to find work, uh, to, to study, uh, to live and, and, and enjoy the things the city has to offer. So that represents on its own quite a significant pressure on the transport network, whether the underground system, the bus network, and in particular for the road network, which as I said, is effectively constrained by uh, lack of appetite for major increases in highway capacity. So one of the consequences of that population growth will be, unless we manage to do something about it, a, a continued pressure for, on congestion on the road network. Now, there are long technical debates about what you mean by congestion. In London, we talk about delay uh, for people using the road network, particularly in, in motorised vehicles, in cars and trucks, uh, compared to what they would experience in free flow conditions. So, as you can see, oh, my mic's collapsed. As you can see, we've already got quite a significant problem of congestion. Th those red lines are the routes in London where the congestion is already quite significant, where you're getting quite significant delays compared to what you'd expect at the quietest times of day. And that problem will only get worse, and not just in central London either, if we don't start thinking even more um, creatively about the toolbox we can use to manage that demand on the road network. 
particularly in central London, but most of the housing and, and employment growth will actually be in outer London in the slightly less dense areas. And as you can see on that map, even there, we've got some quite significant corridors of congestion, and that problem will get worse if we don't try and do something about it in the same time period. The second big challenge we have, and again, I know other cities are facing this problem, is a real public health crisis to do with air quality. We have a serious problem around uh, uh, illness caused by poor air quality. Our mayor, Sadiq Khan, is an adult onset asthmatic. This is an issue absolutely top of his personal agenda. Um, his children uh, went to school in an area in inner London where they, their school play yard was beside a busy road. Uh, and this is a problem experienced particularly by people in low income communities who tend to live by the busiest roads, whose children's schools tend to be by busy roads and who spend more time walking around their local neighborhood and typically breathing in really not very nice air. So we've got a big problem. That map shows where the real hotspots are for air quality in London. And the mayor's made very clear, and I'll come back to this, that he wants to tackle that problem as a matter of urgent priority. Like other cities, we also have challenges around new transportation models, whether business models or technology models. So we've got the issues around rideshare companies arriving. Uh, we've got the issue around doctor cycle hire coming, pressures from uh, developments of autonomous uh, and, and connected vehicles, thinking about how you incorporate those new models of mobility in a system where you're trying to encourage different patterns of mobility is a big challenge for all of us because these things are coming thick and fast um, and trying to keep up with these developments uh, in big cities is quite a challenge and, and, and raises very important questions for the road network, particularly if autonomous vehicles take off in a big way and how you manage those on the road network. And then finally, the challenge that we face is the one set for us by the mayor, Sadiq Khan, in his recently published transportation strategy, which goes out to 2041. The mayor has said that he would like the proportion of walk, cycle, and public transport trips to rise from around two-thirds in the current period to four-fifths by 2041. Now, what that means in transportation choice terms is that the number of car journeys in London will have to fall by about three million a day. So there'll be an absolute reduction in the number of car journeys if we're going to achieve that mode share target while total trip volumes are rising in the same time period. So that's a very significant challenge in terms of the toolbox that you can deploy to get the absolute number of car trips to reduce further and encourage a mode shift from those car trips to walk, cycle, public transport. So the question then becomes, what is the toolbox that a city authority and the transportation authority can apply to try and achieve that quite significant change in travel behaviour uh, to enable people to make those choices in a different way? So mobility pricing, charging for use of the road network, depending on geography or time of day or level of congestion, depending on how you want to play that through, is one of the tools in a city transportation toolbox, but only one, and it sits alongside Improvements in transit, improvements in walk cycle, uh, traffic technology, so you can manage traffic in real time in a more clever way. It's, but it's a critical tool in the toolbox really of any city trying to wrestle with these challenges uh, like Vancouver and like London and Stockholm have done. So just think for a moment about how you can characterize those tools. And I, I try and think about these in, in operating in sort of two dimensions. One is you can either use an infrastructure intervention like a new cycleway or a better transit line, a new metro line like you're about to build on Broadway, um, or you can have non-infrastructure inter interventions, taxation, uh, information campaigns, things that are not directly going to change the physical infrastructure but nonetheless change people's choice matrix in terms of how they go about their daily lives. And you can also think about these tools in terms of whether they encourage or discourage certain sorts of behaviour. So we just rode today with Dale through parts of the city where, where streets have been closed off to traffic but left permeable for cycling. So we've got cafes, we've got street chairs and tables. That is a physical change in the, in the use of that street where you cannot drive through it in a vehicle. So you can change the physical infrastructure or, or your uh, pricing system so that either encourages or discourages uh, certain sorts of behaviour. And obviously, congestion pricing, mobility pricing, is in the category of uh, a, a mode that's designed to discourage certain sorts of behaviour. For example, driving on the busiest road at the busiest time of day or in the busiest part of the city. And that's where you need to see these, these interventions. And you can also think about incentivising people positively through the pricing mechanism as well, in terms of off-peak fares, or thinking about how you might reward people for making the right travel choices. But you need to see mobility pricing in the context of the range of tools that a city can adopt to achieve different travel outcomes. 
So turning to congestion charging. So London uh, had started thinking about congestion pricing five, six, seven years before the first mayoral election in the year 2000. There was a, a big report published in 1995 that produced some analysis around how congestion might uh, affect travel choices, where you might apply it, what you might charge, how you might use the technology to deploy it. And, and when Ken Livingstone was elected as mayor of London, in his manifesto in 2000, he said, if I'm elected as mayor, I will adopt congestion charging based on this analysis uh, within three years of taking office. And so accordingly, uh, in fact, less than three years later, in February 2003, uh, he adopted congestion charging, TfL adopted congestion charging. Now you'll see from the map on the right that the congestion charging zone is a relatively small part of the city. It's about 20 square kilometers in a city whose total land area is about 1,600 square kilometers. So it's not a big area. And there was a very specific problem with congestion in and around that area that was causing significant problems in terms of deadweight costs for business in particular, whose vans and trucks were stuck in queues of traffic getting into and out of that area and in that area. And that was really costing business a lot of money. So there's a strong business interest in thinking about how to reduce that congestion and improve journey time reliability for the critical trips on the network, on the road network in particular. So the scheme was introduced. Uh, it was both preceded and followed by a whole set of other interventions like improvements to the bus network, like pedestrianising Trafalgar Square, which was a big gyratory, a big roundabout. And I don't know why anyone thought that was a good idea in 1964, but we took out traffic on the north side of the square and it's now reverted to being one of the world's great public spaces. Uh, we introduced integrated ticketing through the Oyster system. We provided protected rights away for the buses on our roads. So we did a whole lot of other things, both running up to and after congestion charging, that supported and, and were supported by congestion charging in that central area. So the question obviously is, well, did it work? What did it do to the congestion that was causing the big problems in that particular area in the run up to, to that period? Uh, and the answer to that, well, I'll come back to in a minute, is yes. The other critical point about congestion charging was there was a lot of concern uh, in certain quarters that it would be chaotic, it wouldn't work, that it would kill the economy, that people got a business. So we spent a lot of time and effort on engaging with crucial stakeholder interests and communicating with the population about what it would look like when it arrived, how to pay the fee if you were going to drive into central London, uh, what, what effect it would have on traffic and transport in London. So a lot of pre-engagement, both operationally but also in stakeholder terms, to make sure that people understood what it was for and how it was going to work on the day. And crucially, it worked from day one. When we switched the switch, the system worked, and it's pretty much worked reliably ever since, which was a really important part of why it's, it's established legitimacy and quickly became accepted as part of the transport mix in the city. So what this slide shows is the effect that congestion had on congestion, traffic delay, in the year before and the year after it was introduced. So what you'll see from that chart is a significant reduction in delay in the area affected by and just adjacent to it affected by the charge. So although that doesn't look like a huge reduction, uh, for that was significant in terms of journey time reliability, particularly for business users of the network. So the reduction you know, from sort of four and a half to five minutes delay to sort of three to three and a half minutes was significant enough, sort of 15, 20% improvement in the congestion to really make a big difference to the people who absolutely had to be on the network at the busiest times of day, the busiest days of the week. And that's, that was, that's been broadly preserved since then. Uh, congestion has started to creep back up a bit for other reasons, which you can perhaps go into in Q&A. But the broad benefits of the scheme have remained in place since it was introduced. And it has really remained sort of seen as a legitimate part of the transport mix in the city ever since it was introduced, once it was shown that it was going to work. But there have been other benefits as well. Uh, so although the scheme was not designed as a revenue-raising uh, device, it has nonetheless produced significant net revenues about a 300 million Canadian dollar equivalent a year net revenue, which has all gone into public transport and other transportation improvements. More cycleways, better bus network, uh, changes to the public realm. So we've, di we've directly invested that money back into the transport system. And again, recycling that resource has been a very important part of why it's been seen as a legitimate thing to do. It's been broadly neutral in terms of the economy. Uh, there hasn't been the kind of economic collapse that people feared if you, if, you, if you started pricing certain trips at certain times of the week. It's had beneficial impacts on the environment in terms of emissions reduction, uh, and it has also reduced the number of, of, of collisions, uh, accidents, and, and casualties in the central area just because the system now works in a more predictable uh, and reliable way. 
So the final part of this story is what's coming next in terms of pricing for the road network in London, which is now all about emissions. Uh, in April next year, we're going to introduce what's called the ultra-low emission zone in the same area as applies for congestion charging. If your vehicle does not meet certain published emission standards, you will pay a daily fee on top of the congestion charging fee to drive into that central area. So if you're driving a car, uh, you'll pay £11.50 a day. That's about 20 Canadian dollars. If you're driving a big vehicle, a bus or a truck or a coach, you will pay £100 a day if your vehicle does not meet those standards. So what we're trying to do is encourage particularly big commercial fleets to move their fleet around to buy or lease cleaner vehicles quicker than they might otherwise have done uh, to reduce the emissions in that central area. And then there'll be two further developments which the mayor has recently consulted on and will announce his decision about in the next couple of months. The first is to extend the standards that, already, well, that will apply for heavy vehicles in that central area to the whole of Greater London in about 2020. So if you're driving a big heavy vehicle in anywhere in London in 2020 that does not meet those standards, you will have to pay that same daily charge. So again, the intention is to accelerate the rate at which people improve the uh, environmental performance of their vehicles in order to reduce the emissions that, that are caused by those big vehicles. And then finally, by about 2021, the standards that apply in the central area will apply for all vehicles in a much larger area of inner London, which is that blue hatched area, which, which we call within the north and south circular kind of um, sort of orbital route. Um, and that will be, again, a very significant benefit in terms of the wider air pollution in, those, in that bigger area. So we, the debate's really moved on from congestion as the problem we're trying to solve, at least in the central area, to a really serious issue around emissions, and we're using pricing as a way of achieving that. So what conclusions can you draw from that sort of 15 years of experience of congestion charging being put in and then, and then operated and then more recently developing the, the emissions-based charging systems? First of all, however political commitment is expressed in your particular political system, political commitment is crucial to getting this stuff through because it's difficult to do. Not everyone's happy with it. Um, people have concerns about the effect on their household or their business. And, and having a clear line of sight from the political process through the through the the transportation process is very important. You've got to understand what the effects will be and what the benefits will be and the other impacts will be, and you've got to have clear objectives for your scheme. Uh, you've got to engage very extensively with both key stakeholder interests, but also with a wider travelling public about what you're doing and why and how it's going to affect them. You've got to manage the process of delivering it effectively. If it goes wrong on day one, you're in trouble because people don't believe that you're going to be competent to run it uh, going forward. In my view, in our view, you do have to use the revenue you generate, if there's any surplus revenue, directly on further transportation improvements so people can see the benefit arising from the investment that, they're, that is being made there. You do have to provide uh, alongside, or at least uh, as part of your overall package, uh, reasonable alternatives for people where those alternatives exist. Uh, you have to manage a traffic network properly around the scheme. You do have to have a strong public information campaign to just so people understand how it's going to work from an operational and practical point of view. And as we've discovered in London, you can't sort of rest on your laws. You have to think about what the next development of it's going to be, what the new challenges are, and how congestion or mobility or emissions pricing sits alongside all the other things that a city can deploy to make people think and travel differently. So I hope that's been useful. Uh, this is a debate which I think Vancouver is, is having in a very constructive and positive way. We're going to get the outputs of the Commission, I think, next week. Uh, and hopefully this evening we pass that debate and we can think about the issues and the challenges that you think you're going to face if, if mobility pricing happens here and how it might work and what the effects might be. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for that. And one of the, just to flag, one of the numbers that really stood out in my mind um, that came up during our session today was in terms of just the change on the ground in London. I think you said something like before implementation of the charge had it been something like 180,000 cars in central London every day. And after the charge had dropped to maybe now it's maybe 100 or 110,000. So 70,000 to 80,000 fewer vehicles in the city makes a very significant difference in terms of livability. Um, and then just as a reward to all of you for being here on a Thursday night, um, I was just going to make kind of volunteer that if any of you want to go to London and check out the congestion charge, uh, Ben will be very happy to give any of you a personal tour <laughs> of the uh, Trafalgar Square closing or any of the other wonderful bike amenities they've been able to develop. 
Uh, now we're going to turn to Stockholm, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Matthias Lundberg. He is the head of the Department of Transportation Planning with the city of Stockholm. And back in 2006, when they were debating implementing congestion charging, he was one of the lead consultants supporting the city on the development of the congestion charge. He also got to do a lot of the impact analysis. So he's, his brain is just completely full of numbers in terms of any possible question you could have about congestion charge, what were the results in terms of health, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, cleaner vehicles. Um, and that just something you probably don't know about Matthias is that since he's, he's a, uh, an avid cyclist, and since coming to Vancouver, he tells me, and that was just this past Saturday, he tells me he thinks he's probably taken about 40 or 50 rides on the Moby bike share already. <laughs> so please welcome Matthias to the stage. Thank you so much. And on those bike rides, I've been very impressed with the transportation planning here in Vancouver. But I'm also quite proud of the, of the planning in Stockholm. But today I'm only going to talk to you about uh, the congestion charges scheme we have. And I'll try to focus on, on the effects of it and our experiences. I'll skip the rest. Um, so we have... <laughs> Hard to do this. We have a scheme in place since 2006, and it's a cordon-based uh, thing where you pay entering or leaving this inner city area. And as you can see, Stockholm is built on island, so it, islands, so it was quite easy to find a good design for, for the charging system. It's mainly on the bridges. Uh, one thing that is very, I think, unique is that we introduced it first on a trial basis for seven months in 2006. Then we had a referendum during the general elections. And much to at least my surprise, and many other people's surprise, we got a close yes in, in, those, uh, in that re referendum. And that meant that the charges were reintroduced permanently from 2007. And the way it works is that you pay a fee, as I said, going into or outside of the city. Um, and that charge is di time differentiated during the day. So it's, uh, or at least it was, during the peak hour, the maximum fee was a little less than three Canadian dollars. And uh, half of that during, during the day. And it was free or is free during mornings and evenings and weekends. Uh, in the beginning, uh, alternative fuel cars were exempted, but we tried to have very few exemptions. In London, for example, uh, people living within the, the area, they got very big re re rebates, but we had no such exemptions in Stockholm. Tried to keep the system as clean as possible. Uh, in January 2016, we extended the system somewhat, so now the major bypass road is also charged. It's this one here with roughly 140,000 cars per day. And the maximum charge was also raised. And I should also say that the, the maximum charge you can pay per day is free passages during peak. So that will be... 100 kroner, uh, is it 50, 15 Canadian dollar probably per day. And it was very clear from the beginning that this was done in order to improve traffic conditions and improve the environment. So the politicians, they set up four goals and they all had to do with reducing congestion and improving the environment, both in terms of emissions and in terms of the perceived urban environment. I'll come back to the opinion later, I think. Uh, we didn't, from the beginning, discuss what we should use the revenues for. That was like, that was not the primary purpose. So there was a discussion, should we use it for transport investments, and if so, to public transport or to roads? And during the trial period, it was used for uh, investments in public transport. Then we had a shift in uh, the political majority. So during the first phase of the permanent scheme, 
the money goes to uh, uh, building a new road tunnel. And now, with the extension we've done, that extra money goes to an expansion of the metro. But as I said, that was a secondary thing. The, the, the thing p the politicians really wanted was to achieve a better environment and lower travel times. Uh, technically, we started with uh, a transponder-based system with uh, microwave communication uh, and a free flow system, so you don't have to stay or something. Uh, but after a while, we had cameras for the enforcement already from the beginning. But after a while, we realized that those cameras were working so well, so we could take away the transponder system and only use the cameras. And Nowadays, you will get invoiced automatically once a month, and you can, al you can also have that bill paid automatically. So it's a very easy system for people to use. So, did we see any effects? Yes, we did. This is the number of crossings across the cordon during a typical day. The blue line here is uh, before the charges in 2005. And the red is uh, during the trial period in 2006. And as you can see here, traffic volumes went down with roughly 20% across the cordon. And after that, uh, traffic has stayed almost stable, even though we had had uh, large growth in Stockholm during that time. Uh, large population growth, rather good economy, uh, we had had inflation, but the same price in, in Kronor. So e e even though we, we had that, we see that, that uh, traffic is more or less stable. And that's, that's well in line with what uh, our, our forecast model tells us, because on the long term, people tend to do adaptations. Whenever you change your workplace, for example, you will take these things into consideration, and on the margin, some people will choose workplaces a little bit differently, for example. But the most interesting thing here is we had a perfect natural experiment because, as I said, we had the charges during the trial period, then we took them away for a while before the referendum. So what do you think happened with traffic levels when, when it was non-charged again? I'll answer the question myself. <laughs> Traffic volumes, they of course went up again, but as you can see here, they did not at all come up to previous levels. So that means that people had made a lot of adaptations, and it seems like they kind of liked their adaptations. They, they, they didn't go back to their car, many of them. And could we see any effects? Yes, we could. This is the left Left-hand slide here, the picture I mean, is the way it looks on the main north-south through fair in Stockholm the day before the charges, and the right-hand picture is the day after charges. And as you can see, those 20% less car traffic, it makes a huge difference on the level of congestion. So that meant people could really see what happened. Uh, in my view, though, the most important thing is that uh, travel time reliability uh, was much better after the charges. Uh, this graph is maybe a bit complicated, but uh, the green ones here, that's before the charges, and the blue is after the charges. And for example, on the inner main roads inbound, here is uh, uh, delay time compared to free flow times, compared to what it would take you driving during the middle of the night. And as you can see, it took a little bit more than twice the, the free flow times during the peak before. And that went down to 50% more after the charges. And this staple here, it shows the worst 10% of the days and the best 10% of the days. And as you can see, those became a lot more narrow. And since it's a big sacrifice for people not knowing their travel times, that means you, you always have to have an extra margin if you're going to pick up your kids at kindergarten, come to a meeting or something. So that's really a, something that people will perceive as a big benefit. 
we did do a lot of tra transport modeling before introducing the charges. And we had a large debate on, uh, you, can't, you can't really believe in those forecasts, they never work. But they actually did quite well. Uh, so we forecasted 16% less traffic across the cordon. Reality, it was 20%. Uh, we forecasted, I think, 6% more ridership in public transit. It turned out to be 5%. I might, I might skip that one. Uh, but how did people change their behavior then? Uh, roughly speaking, I said, that, uh, I said that the ridership in public transit went up with 5%. So roughly speaking, half of the car trips that did not take place across the cordon, we could trace them in public transport. And that was mainly for work purposes. The other half, they did all kinds of other adaptations. Maybe they worked at home one day more per month, or they started work a bit earlier, or they did some trip chaining, or they traveled together with a neighbor. Um, the thing that is really interesting is that when you ask people, how did you change? They don't know that themselves. So this is uh, the calculated effect of what people say when they report how they have changed their behavior between 2006 and 2005. We can see that roughly 7% they think they've changed. But we know that in reality, it was 30% less private car trips across the cordon. The 20% is for all trips. 30% is for just the private car trips. So that means people have made a lot of changes but they're not aware of it themselves, because most people, they don't, they don't do the same travels all, every day. So maybe before, maybe you went with car into the inner city four, four days a week, and afterwards maybe you do it two or three days a week. And you can't really remember that a year later. And to me that's very interesting. Um, and we also did see that we could got less emissions, which was one of the main purposes, um, roughly corresponding to, to the decrease in, in uh, the number of vehicle kilometers traveled. And acceptance was, um, it was not a very popular uh, measure from the beginning. There was a large negative uh, debate in media and so on. Uh, but still we had quite a large support, perhaps 40% of people thought this was a good idea. Then, as you often can see, that support drops the closer to implementation you get. So it was at its lowest just before the charges started. And then after the charges were introduced, it raised drastically. And then again after the, it was reintroduced. And then it stayed quite stable on high levels. The complicating thing with this is that if you ask people in a referendum, you tend to do that when you know all the details and have all your plans ready, and that's typically here. So that's what we call the value of political death. It's really when it's hard to find a support. And my last slide then. Did people appreciate it? On the left hand, you can see uh, the headlines we had before the charges started. It was, it was in media every day on all the papers and all, all other medias. And all the headlines were like, cows for the congestion charges, it will never work, and uh, the cows continues. And uh, as I said, the day after, virtually the day after, the headlines changed to that what you see on the right hand side. Stockholmers love, love their charges and so on. And if I should conclude with something, it is that it's often like that, that before you've seen something, you tend to see all the negative things that can happen, and after something is in place, it, it kind of feels, well, this is just natural. And that's what I think has happened in Stockholm with charges. Thank you.
Matthias. Okay, great. So now we're going to just pivot to the panel portion of the evening. And um, just wanted to remind folks who have uh, questions that you can go to this link, gl glsr.it forward slash everything else, and you can submit your questions. And I'm already actually getting a lot of really, really informed, very impressive, excellent questions on here, so that's great. And we'll try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, and um, you can also vote on other people's questions. You can like other people's questions so that you can bump up a smart question in the list if you want us to particularly try to get to that one. Um, I will introduce now Kristen Simpson joining us on the panel. Um, Kristen's been working with the Seattle Department of Transportation for more than 20 years. And as she very humbly puts it, uh, she has a history of working on projects well before or just before they become popular. So she, this is also known as a visionary in case of any, any I didn't like kind of figure that out. Um, she has worked on car sharing when it was a small nonprofit with just a handful of cars. She led the approval process for Seattle's first modern streetcar. And she managed the team that built Seattle's first neighborhood greenway and protected bike lane projects. And now, if you'll notice a pattern, all those things were successful. Now she's managing the congestion pricing study for the city of Seattle. So please uh, join me in welcoming Kristen to the stage as well. Okay, so I wanna start off with actually a question for Kristen. Um, some of you may know, I'm not sure if you, you follow the, the papers down there, but uh, uh, Seattle's new mayor, Mayor Durkin, recently made an announcement um, about an ambitious package of policies that was designed to cut Seattle's greenhouse gas emissions. And congestion pricing was one of the transportation policies that was in that package. So I wanted to ask Kristen to speak a little bit about um, what is the conversation going on right now on, uh, in Seattle, and how would uh, congestion pricing fit into the trajectory or the arc of Seattle's uh, overall leadership on sustainable transportation? Thanks, Amanda. So Seattle's conversation about congestion pricing, at least in terms of a London or Stockholm style um, cordon, is really just getting started. I mean, we have some tolling with fixed and variable rates on some of our regional freeways, um, but thinking of it uh, in terms of a downtown congestion pricing is really quite new in terms of the public conversation. Um, as Amanda mentioned, um, our mayor, Jenny Durkin, who was elected last fall, um, announced in April that congestion pricing would be one of the cornerstones of her climate protection um, plan, and that she would like a proposal for that congestion pricing by the end of her first term in 2021. Um, so while the focus has been in the announcement on the climate protection, uh, it does tie in really closely with our um, sustainable mobility goals, our goals for um, affordability in transportation, um, like Vancouver, we have an affordable housing crisis, and we know that transportation costs play a role in how, how affordable housing can be. Um, we also have some livability goals that congestion pricing can really help address um, in terms of making our center city a place where people want to visit, shop, um, enjoy our many amenities, and having a less congestion downtown can really help that as well. Um, Matthias, I wanted to, to turn to you now, and um, my understanding uh, of the Stockholm congestion charge is that initially there was not a lot of public support for this concept. It was met with maybe skepticism, concern, people don't like paying for something that was, that was free before, um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about kind of how that changed over time, um, and how did, how did you, as, um, as somebody working in the transportation field, how did the transportation planners handle that initial public opposition? Yeah, as I said, the results were, they were at least as good as we would have thought. Um, and that helped a lot, of course. And, and there were an enormous amount of concern raised before. And we, ha we had to investigate all kinds of questions. It was, what will happen to equity? What will happen to tax transport? What will happen to the garbage deliveries? What will happen to driving schools? You name it. But as we could show afterwards, there, there wasn't really any negative impacts for any of them. And so what's happened afterwards is that I think it's helped making pricing and other regulations towards car traffic 
more like a natural tool in a toolbox. So afterwards we've moved on with uh, a new parking plan, for example, that wouldn't have been possible, I think, 10 years ago, for example. Wonderful. Um, ben, uh, uh, London, as I, as, I, as I recall, London's scheme was introduced in 2003, so that we're about 15 years out from that. Um, so I, I have a question here, and also it's, it's coming up quite a bit in the stream here. Um, how, how has the world changed in 15 years? Uh, what, what would you do differently, if anything, this time? Um, and with, you know, that we mentioned earlier, several North American cities considering their own schemes, is anything meaningfully different in your mind regarding maybe technology, mobility choices, attitudes, um, such that you might do, do a different type of a scheme than you, than you did in 2003 if you were starting now? Uh, wow, if history were different. I, I think uh, for the time uh, it was exactly the right scheme to do because there was a very clear sense of what the problem was, which was congestion in a very specific part of the city that had a, had a reasonably robust price tag attached to it, uh, which was essentially a deadweight cost to the economy of, you know, particularly business uh, vehicles calling queues and, and having to take longer than they should have done to make deliveries. And, and for that reason, the, the, the scheme introduced in that particular area, in that particular way, I think was the right thing to do. Um, clearly, technology has moved on a long way since then in terms of uh, remote communications, um, uh, real-time data. Uh, but I think I would, I would say to anyone thinking about uh, this kind of scheme being introduced as part of a broader strategy is do not rely on technology which doesn't work yet. Because if you invest in technology which might not work on the first day, you will struggle to recover from a kind of reputational point of view. So the reason why we went for the technology which we did, which is uh, actually number, uh, camera-based number plate recognition, license plate recognition, was because we knew it worked. Uh, so I think um, you would probably adopt a different technology now if you knew it was going to work, uh, but I think the area and the purpose was exactly right for the time. So I have a question here from someone probably in Toronto, um, which means someone's watching on the web stream. Um, so the question is, is available capacity on alternative modes, notably subways and buses, necessary in order for congestion pricing to be successful? And then, and then they go on to ask, uh, does this make Toronto, with its at-capacity subway, a poor candidate for a congestion pricing scheme? And just a related question is, how important was it to roll out transit improvements in advance of congestion pricing so that there were choices available for those who chose not to drive? Maybe for both or either one of you. Uh, I think, because we, I, I didn't say that, but we, we also made uh, especially bus improvements uh, when we introduced the charges. I think they were very important for acceptance, but they were maybe not that important uh, to be able to handle the traffic. Because those five extra percent in public transit, that corresponds roughly to two or three years normal growth in public transit in Stockholm anyway. So. And as I said, there are so many other trip purposes and, and ways for people to adapt than just switching to public transit. So I think it's often a concern that is not that it, that is that you don't have to pay that much attention to it as, as people tend to think. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and again, the, the important thing to remember about congestion charging in London is that all the people coming into central London during the peak period in the working days, a relatively small proportion were making those trips by car. Mm -hmm. And so the number of people that got out of their cars and onto the, transport, the other transport choices, if that's what they decided to, was a relatively small proportional increase in exactly the same way as Matthias just said. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think you need to make sure that uh, the, you know, each city scheme will need to be designed for the circumstances in which it finds itself in terms of public transport capacity, where the journeys are being made, what alternative things people might do. Uh, but I don't think you need to kind of double capacity or do anything like that. So you have to make enough adjustment that people can uh, make that choice if that's what they decide to do. But, but the marginal effect is not as great as people think mm -hmm. uh, because the absolute number of people affected compared to the overall volume of people traveling is relatively small to achieve a big congestion benefit.
So one of the, um, uh, Dale mentioned earlier that we've been involved with something called the 100 Hours Campaign in Los Angeles, which is reflecting the fact that drivers spend 104 hours a year stuck in traffic congestions, over two and a half weeks stuck in traffic. So we've been talking to a lot of people in the, in the Los Angeles region about this concept. And one of the questions that I get a lot, and one of the questions I'm seeing come up on the stream, um, is about equity and fairness. Um, and the idea that a flat charge that would be a higher proportion of the income for low-income families than wealthier um, travelers would be, um, in its nature, regressive. So I wanted to ask Kristen because um, she's just heading up a, an RFP for, for Seattle, and one of the aspects of that is how could we make a congestion pricing scheme in Seattle not just equitable, but as, um, as Seattle Council Member Mike O'Brien has put it, how could we ensure that low-income travelers are the chief beneficiaries of a congestion pricing scheme. So I wonder, Chris, if you could speak a little bit about equity in Seattle. I'd love to, thank you. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about is what are the equity questions and then how do we answer them? And I think in answering the questions, we're looking at um, two different ends of the spectrum. One is to use the data that we have and collect new data if we need to, to really understand who is traveling, when and where are they going, do they have other options? Um, what are their needs in terms of not just origin and destination, but do they need to have equipment with them? Um, do they need to travel at specific times? Um, really understanding from a data perspective what's happening. But I think the other really important piece is to have meaningful conversations with the affected communities. The people who are closest to the impacts are going to be the people who have the best insights into the solutions. And we really want to have those consultations um, up front. Those same tools, I think, are relevant for other potentially affected um, sectors, so small businesses, large businesses, um, people coming from outside the region, pe people traveling by ferry. And, and Ben and Matthias, having now implemented congestion charging schemes, I wonder if you could reflect on, did, did equity concerns come up in the conversations about implementation? How did you handle them in, in the design or in the use of the revenue? Um, and then what have your um, uh, analysis of the data post-implementation, what have they told you about whether those concerns about equity um, impacts were, were realized or whether those were, um, in fact, uh, unbased? So, um, again, I think uh, it's been very striking in the last few days. The, the, the issue of equity is clearly a big, big uh, debating point and a key issue in the, in the North American context. In the, in the case of the London congestion charging zone, it was an issue uh, and we are required when we consult on schemes like this to do what's called an EQIA, an Equalities Impact Assessment Statement, which looks at the potential equity and social impact of these sorts of changes. Um, but crucially, in the case of the London congestion charge, the number of lower income people commuting into central London by car, which was the issue that was at stake, was really relatively low. So people, by and large, don't commute in the central London by car, and an even smaller proportion of people who do uh, are on a low income and relying on their car for that journey. They would almost certainly be making their way into town, probably by bus if they had a low income, if they were in a low income household. And the other side of that argument is that the, the benefit that the congestion charging produced in terms of uh, bus journey reliability improvements and investment in the bus network in particular would have been overwhelmingly beneficial to people on lower income who tend to use buses for their daily travel purposes. So on both sides of that equation, as it happened in London, uh, the penalties for lower income uh, drivers were relatively small in, in overall terms, and the benefits in terms of where the transport system improves as a consequence would overwhelmingly and disproportionately benefit people who would rely on the bus, uh, and that tends to be people on lower incomes, particularly for work, uh, because it's cheaper per trip than the underground is. And it's a very similar story in Stockholm. We also had a, quite a large debate beforehand on, on equity concerns, and uh, we did studies on, on how it would affect. And as a group, low-income people weren't affected very much at all, because just as in London, the, those people, generally speaking, don't take their cars during peak hours to central Stockholm. But of course, you can always find some person that, that will lose out, but they are very few. So I'd say that after implementation, we haven't had any discussion about equity uh, 
uh, uh, when it comes to congestion charges. That's, that's, so, that's so interesting. It's so, un it's, it's so unexpected. Um, so I have, to, uh, I have to honor this voting system, and I have to tell you the number one question that's popping up without uh, any even close second um, is, is a question for Ben and Matias, which is if, and this is, this is showing to me the, the educated nature of this crowd, I have to say, I'm fairly impressed with this question. If the technology had been available to do distance-based congestion charging when you implemented your schemes in London and Stockholm, do you think you would have done it as opposed to a cordon zone system? Yeah, good question. Actually, I don't think so. I, I was very much in favor of it because from a theoretical point of view, that's the way to do it. But then again, partly because we have the geography we have, we can approximate a, a distance-based scheme quite well with just one zone, or maybe we should add some other zones later. Uh, and it's a system that is so much easier to understand, so much easier to enforce, things like that. So I'd say I probably do the same system, more or less. Yeah, I'm afraid to say I'm going to be very boring and say I, I broadly agree with that because uh, even if the technology had been available, um, uh, the, the challenge and the solution were, were fairly well understood. Uh, and, and the system that we put in was relatively simple from a technological point of view. Uh, and as I said earlier on, it worked incredibly well. So I was saying earlier today that the customer satisfaction rating for the operation of congestion charging, this is people paying to drive their cars in central London, is 87%. Right, that's the highest satisfaction rate for any service that we operate. So as a system of payment for a, for a product, in this case, it works incredibly well. So the call center works really well. If you have a problem with your payment, it gets refunded very quickly. So, so I, think, I think, like Matthias, because the problem was well understood and, and the solution was broadly understood, uh, I think even if the technology had been available, we probably would have done the same thing at the time. Um, and Partly also because it's now allowed a broader conversation, which is what happened tonight, about how else might you apply that sort of approach as the technology allows you to do that. But I think it kind of established the principle that people needed to pay for uh, if they wanted to drive in at a congested time of day in a congested part of the city. And that was very important in establishing that principle. So I wanted to um, give you a little kind of window into one of the conversations we had today at our convening. Um, and uh, we were asked a really provocative question, which was, what can we learn on this topic of equity? What can we learn about uh, thinking about other sectors? Um, thinking about energy, thinking about food, thinking about water, utilities. Um, and uh, because we had a, a creative facilitator for this session, uh, we were asked not just to report back in sort of standard format, but to get a little creative with the way we reported back information. And so we had a little skit um, from, from one of our teams. And they were making the point, um, they, were, they, were, they were taking a, a page from the anti-smoking campaign. And they were making the point that it used to be very, very normal to be able to sit in a restaurant and you know, smoke and exhale and, you know, and pollute the air of those sitting just next to you. And then that used to be something that people just kind of took for granted and accepted. Uh, and that over time, that became gradually less and less acceptable when it, when it became clear what were the negative health impacts um, of, of inhaling the smoke. And so then we put the people outside and then we banned smoking in restaurants. And, and, and you know, now it's, it's not even conceivable that you would get onto an airplane and, you know, light up a cigarette, but we still have in the bathrooms of our airplanes those little cigarette <laughs> disposal well, um, little bins, which is, just, which is just such a funny kind of relic of another time. Um, and so I wanted to ask um, uh, Kristen and maybe the panel just to reflect on kind of where, we, where are we in, um, in the idea of public accept acceptability of, of mobility pricing. That This um, past summer, Governor Cuomo in New York City called in the New York Times, called congestion pricing an idea whose time has come. Um, and so I wanted you just to reflect on sort of where are we in terms of thinking about uh, is, is mobility pricing indeed an, an idea whose time has come? <laughs> Clearly it, it has come to some cities and it is coming to other cities. It is, uh, its time will come. Um, I think in terms of the way we talk about it, we, we need to figure out a way to focus on what the benefits are, what people are getting for this 
um, as opposed to what they're losing or what they're paying? Yeah, I, I think the answer is it depends. Uh, and it's clearly the debate sort of different point even within the North American context it's also I mean Beijing has been talking about congestion charging uh, for several years now so this is not even just an issue in uh, in the West it's, it's true really across the world um, it seems to me that uh, to Christopher's point you have to understand uh, that there are significant benefits including for people who who are in the decongested network right so the benefit for business in the London context was the journey that they were having to make which they had no choice but to make uh, you cannot put your delivery of bottled water to an office on the underground system. I mean, you have to be uh, have a truck on the road. But those journeys became more reliable, and, and the overhead associated with having to double shift their drivers or to leave stuff in acute traffic queue uh, was significantly reduced. So I think the question is really how to frame uh, what the issue is, how to frame what the benefits will be, including for the people who, who, who remain on the network, because in every case there are significant numbers of car journeys still going on. Um, and... and it, develop the story incrementally in, in a way that makes sense in the particular context in which you find yourself. So how you describe this and how you do it uh, in, in uh, Vancouver or Seattle will not be how we did it in London. Um, and although there are similar attributes in London and Stockholm, they're not quite the same either. So it does have to be, although the broad arguments are the same, the context is very specific about how you actually do it and what you talk, how you talk about it, I think. It was, it was one of my sort of um, most powerful takeaways from the day, that that, that comparison that was drawn between the anti-smoking campaign and something like this, is that just that, to have an awareness that there is an impact on other people of your decision to light up a cigarette, and that we've now come to realize that. And, the, and that similarly, there is an impact to your neighbors, to the person who's trying to ride a bike right next to you. There is an impact to that decision to get in your car and drive on a, on a city street. And I just... I, I don't think that we've really th maybe thought about things um, in that way, but as a, you know, as a cyclist in San Francisco who battles the traffic at every intersection, that, you know, there's a real impact, there's a real psychological impact of uh, having a car pass you very, very quickly. It's extremely uncomfortable. It's sometimes, at the end of the day, it's, it sometimes can be quite stressful. So I think that, that that's a very, very interesting conversation to start. Um, and then sort of relatedly, sort of given the, the heavy social and environmental costs of congestion all across North America. Given that Los Angeles has reached that 100 hours threshold, I was just looking at the data and um, even the city of Atlanta has uh, some legendary congestion. Turns out Atlanta has the ninth worst congestion of any major city actually in the entire world. Um, and it's one of the key, they did a survey recently of people who've moved to Atlanta. And one of the things that people say, the, the number one complaint is traffic and the lack of, of adequate transportation choices um, for getting around. So, so given all of those costs, d does the panel feel that it is really just a matter of time, almost, that until uh, cities start to, to implement congestion pricing at scale? Or, or is there another solution that is as holistic, as effective at reducing congestion and is also lasting, uh, the way that you show that, that reduced 20% is sustained year over year? Is there another solution out there that cities should be looking at that's as effective, holistic, in terms of climate and congestion? Or really, is it going to come to mobility pricing? What do you think? Well, I, I can't uh, project what's happening in, in, in the United States. But I think it, will, it, it is a necessary tool in your toolbox. But it has, in this, at the same time, it's not a silver bullet that it will solve everything. You have to use all the tools in your toolbox. This is one of them that I think is needed, but when and if it comes to the States, I wouldn't dare guessing. Yeah. I think I'll be similarly modest in that projection, but, but I, I think it is, uh, as more cities come to adopt their version uh, of some kind of road charging system, um, to your point about the analogy with smoking and, and public attitudes towards that, it will, it will seem to be an increasingly uh, legitimate part, a normal part in the sense of what cities do. And I think the question really is, is precisely how it deploys, it's, it's deployed in different cities, depending on the circumstances, how fast it's done, is it done incrementally or in, a big, in, in one go? Um, but I think it will, it will come to be seen as one of the things that cities do in their own way. And not every city will do it. Uh, other cities will decide they can't deliver it or they, they can't get it sort of through past public opinion. But I think in a growing number of cities, um, it will start to be adopted, just as to, to this point, is one of the things that cities can do. 
you know, I think one of the reasons that, that um, congestion pricing has been so effective is that it serves as a financial disincentive to you to, to drive a car and, so, and, and, and sort of by associations. And it, it's an incentive to, to use a, a lower carbon mode of travel. Uh, I, I sometimes like to think about sort of flipping that on its head and rather than looking at disincentives, are there ways that we could further incentivize people to ride bikes or to walk or to use transit or use, use modes of transportation that have um, less pollution for cities? Um, and I think Chris and I think Seattle experimented with something like that. Um, I think they called it a mobility wallet, which was more on the side of incentivizing the use of choices other than driving. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that mobility wallet concept and is there room to kind of join the idea of disincentives uh, with incentives? Yeah, I think if we go back to the toolbox analogy, um, congestion pricing or cordon pricing is a very large hammer, perhaps even a power hammer. Um, and I think in order to be able to uh, justify employing that in our cities, we need to demonstrate uh, to our residents that we have used the smaller tools first, um, that we've done what we can um, with less intrusive and, like you were saying, more incentive-based um, tools as we work our way up to needing to use the larger tools. So things like um, the mobility wallet where um, it's, it's sort of an imaginary box of cash that you either deplete or add to based on your mobility choices, um, looking at other transportation demand tools um, that can help people um, make choices that would lead to lower congestion without actually doing the charging. Um, I think we'll need to show those um, things like peak hour garage exit, uh, uh, pricing for transportation network companies. We're going to have to show that we've done the little things before we do the big thing. So, so for all of us um, in, the, in the transportation sector, this is actually a really fascinating time to be working in this field. Um, probably many of you have tracked kind of the rise of what we call new mobility or shared mobility services over the last several years. I think we've all seen those growth curves, even for uh, the availability of bike share to virtually non-existent to you know, over a thousand cities in the world, over a million bike shares um, in use around the world in a reasonably short period of time. Similar kind of growth curves with the rise of Uber and Lyft and on-demand mobility services. And then of course, everyone's talking about autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, and how that's really gonna change transportation. So thinking about some of those kind of new waves, those new trends coming in transportation, um, I wonder if, if the panel could reflect on, is there a connection between autonomous vehicles, shared mobility, Lyft, Uber, sh um, and, and pricing? Are these separate conversations, or is there any room to join these conversations together? Is there any reason that should we, we should be thinking about pricing in the context of the evolving nature of mobility? Uh, yes. Uh. One thing is that if, for example, electrical cars becomes very, very popular, you, you have to find, and also autonomous vehicles, you have to find other ways of, of managing your traffic. Because today we depend quite much on petrol taxis, for example, but that, that can't anymore be, be uh, uh, something to steer traffic with. So in that way, I think um, you have to use other tools and I think mobility pricing is probably very important then. Yeah, I think they are clearly linked. So, so uh, 100,000 autonomous uh, shared mobility vehicles searching for a fare is the same essentially in traffic terms as 100,000 people driving around looking for a parking space. I mean, it's, it's, so I think the question is really, uh, what does the city want itself to be like in terms of environment, road safety, public spaces, the quality of life? And you have to design your policy tools, your operational tools, in a way that ensures that those technologies are deployed in a way that's beneficial and benevolent for the city rather than uh, unhelpful. And so it seems to me you, can't, you have to include those new technologies in your policy toolbox uh, and not kind of exempt them just because they're new and exciting. Uh, and I think we've got to be very careful not to get kind of too caught up in how innovative this all is because, you know, if my child was run down by an autonomous vehicle, I'd be just unhappy that they'd run down my vehicle driven by a human being. So you've got to be very careful not to kind of get too starry-eyed about this stuff and make sure that you put it in your toolbox and manage it just like you manage any of the existing technologies, I think. Here's a really interesting question that's come up through the stream. Somebody asks, how, how might we run a real-life but low-cost region-wide 
pilot for distance-based decongestion charging so that people can experience the benefits. And this, of course, goes to the, the startup costs and all the challenges and getting something in place, but I think it's a really creative idea, and I think it you know, really goes to sort of Matthias's slide there of that, you know, or, and even what Ben describes about day one, you can, t you can sense that change, and that is what s leads to the, the favorability ratings. So how can you give people almost like a sneak preview of what it could be um, in order to build public support for something like this? Well, I, I think that's really interesting because it, you, you'd have to think very carefully about, I mean, this is not my domain at all, so, but just speculating nonetheless. Um, you'd have to design a system that had, this, that had approaching the same material effect on people's real decisions as the real thing would do, right? So it actually would have to be charged. Uh, and you'd have to find some way of getting enough people to be inside your pilot, either voluntarily or uh, through some other means, that, that you could tell what it, how it would work at scale. So I think if you could design a system that looked and felt like a real system, uh, people were actually charged, whatever the charge would be, for whatever the, the, the congestion was, um, and they actually changed their behaviour in a way that was broadly comparable to what they do, then I think that would be fantastic. Off the top of my head, I can't think how you design such a scheme, because unless you mandated it, in which case it would be essentially a real scheme, it would be quite hard to get the, the same scale effects that you might get if it was a real system. But I mean, other people may be more creative than me. Yeah, I also stumble on the if. I, I can't really see how we can do it. But if you could do it, of course, then, then you could really show people whether, whether their concerns would come true or not, which would, I mean, based on my experience, w would be very, very helpful. But I'm stumbling on that first if. My other observation would be, it's quite interesting, uh, Matthias' statistic about the fact that when the scheme was taken out before it was put back in again, congested or traffic didn't go back to its previous volume and I suspect that's because the period it was introduced for was long enough that people actually changed what they did habitually so you'd have to introduce a pilot for long enough that people think actually I'm just not going to do that so often anymore and that will be a kind of system change whereas if you did it for like two weeks the chances are they'd probably revert to their previous behavior very quickly after so you'd have to do it for long enough for them some people to actually change what they did on a sort of semi-permanent basis and that's you know certainly several months and potentially single figures of years, I think. Because mm -hmm. it was seven, how long was it in? Seven months. Yeah, I mean, that feels long enough for people to start changing what they do sort of on a, on a permanent basis. So, someone in the audience um, asks, is, it seems that Vancouver is a good candidate for charging. Are there any cities that are too small for charging? <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> but it, it all depends on why, why you want to have charging. Because you really need to have a clear objective. If it is to, to, to curb congestion, I mean, a city that is in, small enough to not to have any congestion, then it would make no sense. But if, if, if the goal is something else, reducing carbon dioxide, for example, then, then, it, then it could be worthwhile. So it all comes down to what, what objectives you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a question here for Kristen. Um, in the context of North American cities that may not have as many transportation choices, uh, there's a concern that congestion pricing could be uh, inequitable if it felt that people didn't have uh, an alternative. Yeah. So maybe you could just reflect on that and kind of how you might go about addressing those kinds of concerns. Well, one of the things that was really interesting from the presentations was um, the gap between the actual increment of new transit needed and the perception, and the perception that was, is that there was much more um, that was needed. Um, so, and one of the contrast with what we're looking at in Seattle um, is that um, in contrast to Stockholm, we do have uh, some initial thoughts on how we would spend any revenues that were generated by congestion pricing and, and that is almost entirely focused on improving transit options, um, especially in low-income neighborhoods and for low-income uh, travelers, um, looking at transportation demand management, and also uh, providing electrification for vehicles in uh, underserved areas. Okay, I think we probably have just time for maybe one more question and then we're gonna to turn to Andy for some uh, wrap up remarks. So I would just ask, um, I would just ask uh, Ben and Matthias, um, because you've gone through this um, journey, uh, thinking about North American cities that, that we spent the day with um, and here in Vancouver considering mobility pricing, sort of what, what guidance, what advice would you give 
um, in terms of starting down the road, how to build a, a successful scheme that maximizes benefits for the residents of those cities. So the interesting thing that I've taken away from the conversations over the last couple of days is that the timeline for how these things happen is broadly the same. So, so I, I mentioned in my um, opening remarks that the debate about whether we should do congestion charge on this began some time before it actually happened. So just shy of a decade it took from the kind of first studies done into how it might work in practice to being introduced following the mayoral election. So first of all, I don't think you should do this quickly because you have to understand where you do it, how you do it, why you're doing it, what the net costs and benefits would be. Uh, and my second observation would be um, uh, uh, it, it, you're better off doing uh, a good scheme than the perfect scheme. Because if you try and do the absolutely perfect scheme, A, it'll probably never happen because it'll take too long to work out what it is, but also uh, it'll probably be too complicated. So I think you need to find a scheme that's good enough to achieve the benefits uh, and, and, to, and to be demonstrably uh, legitimate, um, because if you try to do the perfect scheme, you probably won't achieve it, and then actually you've probably lost the chance. And there have been cities in, in the UK where they've had public votes on this, and, and the vote's been unsuccessful on that, and then you have to sort of go around the whole thing again, but a little while later, because the, people say, well, we had that conversation, we decided not to do it, uh, and I think you have to make sure that if you do it, you do it right, and then that establishes the principle, and you can then think about how you evolve it. I always tend to think it's hard to give advice to other cities because context is so different. But, but I, I would say try to formulate very clear objectives, preferably something that people really care about, uh, that, that can engage people, and then try to, to find a design that can really meet those goals is, is very important. And I also think it's important to really try the best you can to answer people's concerns as, as objective as you can. Bring some experts in that, 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 that people want to question and, and, and let, them, let them try to answer. Um, that, that's a couple of things I think of. Excellent. Kristen, any, any closing thoughts? I'm extremely grateful for the advice from our <laughs> colleagues who've gone before <laughs> and look forward to one day being in the position of talking about the system that we have successfully implemented. So thank you. Well, given, uh, given her track record, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were back here in a couple years having that conversation. Um, great. Well, I wanted to just thank all of you for your engagement and all of your excellent questions. Um, Dale, this is a treasure trove of, of comment and, and, and the platform here, so we'll continue to revisit as we move forward. Um, and I also just wanted to give a, a warm uh, round of thanks to our panel. Thank you so much. Okay, so Andy, we will turn, turn the stage back to you for some closing remarks. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Amanda. And I'd like to just thank the panel again and thank Dale, Mateus, Ben, Kristen about coming to Vancouver and, and speaking about the, I guess, a round of applause, please, for, for them, for the presentation tonight. <laughs> And very much taking the perspectives of what's happening in London, Stockholm, and Seattle. And indeed, I think when we think about the challenges ahead of us for Vancouver, one has to remember that Vancouver, and as described in 1914, was once described as the city of optimists, as by uh, Thomas Mawson, who was a great Scottish landscape architect who actually created one of the first uh, plans for the city of Vancouver. And that I think in the 104 years since this first, very, very first plan, key piece of planning trivia here, folks, about Vancouver, that one kind of makes an observation today about not only the city of Vancouver, but about metropolitan Vancouver, that, about, that perhaps about this city of optimists, that optimism dies in traffic that very much this presents the kind of challenges ahead of us, I think particularly as a region and as a, as a city, and kind of ensuring the, the, the kind of connections we have towards our communities. And I think that it's not only talking about mobility pricing, but it's talking about engaging the cost of congestion, whether that be in public health, climate change, the issue of affordability, I think in terms of not only transportation, but then also in housing and terms of economics. 
the opportunity cost of sitting in traffic to very much the price of the labor costs of sitting in traffic, that I think it presents very much the kinds of challenges that we're going to face in engaging the costs of congestion. And that the fact that I think a key part of this presentation has been this discussion that there are no magic bullets, but only a thoughtful toolkit. And that that toolkit is going to be learning from cities such as London, Stockholm, and hopefully soon Seattle. And really bringing in those examples and then adapting the, those tools from abroad in towards our local, um, our, our, our local challenges. Um, I think I was talking to Ben that, uh, that here we are with a whole set of tools, but yet it needs to be, I think, flavored, that it isn't a particular single se selection, that uh, I just got off the plane from Barcelona and saying that it's about creating the different paellas that one can find <laughs> throughout that country, that there isn't one single national paella, but then it's individually flavored. And that fundament, hey, this is the first time I get to do these little kind of wrap ups, so I'm going to like <laughs> sprinkle it up. Um, at that, in that conversation, I think finally it is, I think, this profound concern, and I think rightfully, an issue of equity, an issue of justice, and an issue of really how do we ensure a sense of fairness. And I think that, you know, in, in, a, in a region, we're talking about a region where 60% of transit users are renters. Uh, the fact that 50% of new immigrants use transit to get around the region, that fundamentally it kind of begins a conversation about what kind of region we're going to build and how we move around. And I'd like to thank you for giving me the chance to kind of offer final comments. Thank, I'd like to thank the audience and you in the interwebs for uh, coming to this event. And I think we're kind of done. Dale, I think he... I think they're all done. And thank you so much. I'll see you at the next event for the city program. <laughs>